Robots Radio presents. In 2014, director Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu and star Michael Keaton gave the world a brutally honest vision of the potentially maddening spotlight of fame. In 2019, we continue our tour through a line of famous Irish whiskies. The film is Birdman. The whiskey is Jameson Caskmates IPA, and we'll review them both. This is the, the Film and Whiskey Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at the 2014 film Birdman, or if you're using the full title, Birdman or the Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance. Brad, I'm super excited to get into this movie. I think this, aside from Green Book, this might be the most recent movie we've done on the podcast so far. Yeah, honestly, we've reviewed Green Book. And I don't know a few others from the 2000s, but this is definitely our second movie in the teens, which which excites me because I think it's been long enough since it came out that we can kind of take a more objective look at it. It's been five years now, but it still feels really fresh. It's you know you don't have the sort of barrier sometimes that you face when you're looking at a movie that's 80 or 90 years old. Yeah, we're able to kind of ask those questions like, is Michael Keaton a massive hypocrite because he's been in superhero films since this movie? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think that there's somebody that can help us answer these questions, Brad. Today we are joined live in studio by a person we have not heard from in a long time. One of our favorite guest hosts, Jordan McCain. Jordan, how you doing today, man? I'm doing well. I'm in Ohio. It's snowing. There's whiskey in front of me, and we're talking about one of my favorite movies. So I'm pumped to be here. All right, Jordan is already laying his cards out on the table. One of his favorite movies, which I guess leads us into the question I have to ask Brad every week. Brad, had you seen the movie Birdman prior to this viewing? Robert, as any normal American citizen, I have not seen the movie Birdman. <laughs> wow. Wait, can you can you expand on that, Brad? What do you mean by that? I think honestly, like one of the issues with this movie is that it really does fit in with the stereotype of you know an Oscar's best picture that just doesn't connect with the American public. You know, in a lot of different ways, Birdman is an introspective look on the cost of fame as a movie actor in Hollywood. And the movie is made by Hollywood, so it just kind of feels like this self-insulated type of film. That honestly, like you know, I'll lay my cards on the table. I really love the movie. I thought it was really good, but I can understand why it wouldn't connect with the American public. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Brad. We're definitely going to talk about that as we go on because this movie definitely picked up a reputation for being pretentious and. If you look at the slate of movies that were nominated for Best Picture that year, I was really pulling for this movie to win Best Picture because I also really love this movie, and it was kind of neck and neck with a movie called Boyhood. Boyhood was a movie that was shot over the course of like twelve years. It was really ambitious, but it was a small independent film, and I actually found Boyhood to be a way more pretentious movie than this. So it's really interesting to see people's perspectives. On this movie, you know, does it work? Does it not work? Is it pretentious? Is it making fun of pretentious people? And I think that we're definitely going to explore some of those possibilities over the course of the podcast. But in order to do that, we have to move along to our favorite segment, which is Brad explains. This is the segment where Brad tells us all about the movie that he's never seen before. Brad, can you fill our listeners in on the plot of the movie Birdman? So, Birdman is a movie about an uh, older man named Riggin Thompson, and Riggin Thompson played a superhero character about you know twenty five, thirty years ago named Birdman, and this fame has kind of come at a cost in the sense that he he's kind of seen as a sellout by the quote unquote real actors, you know, and the movie critics and the theater critics. And so the movie is about how he is trying to regain a sense of importance by putting on a play in New York City. You know, it's a play that he wrote and directed and stars in himself, and he's trying to reclaim this sense of who he is as an actor and as a person by starring in this production that he wrote and directed himself. 
It's about how he fights with the theater critics who don't think he's a real actor. It's how he's fighting with his past of, you know, being a superhero movie star who made millions. He's grappling with the fact that people still recognize him for a role he played 30 plus years ago. You know, it's really a struggle for him to understand who he is. And, you know, there's other things that kind of go on in the movie. But honestly, I, I don't know if there's anything else really to say. That is the main plot of the movie. I do think you left out one major point of the movie, which is that Regan Thompson is going insane. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't really notice that in the movie. What, <laughs> what makes you say that, Bob? Or does he have superpowers? That's true. So in the movie, Birdman, the, the main character of Regan Thompson is being spoken to by this voice in his head, which we later find out is the, the voice of Birdman, the character that he played. And we basically come to learn that Birdman is like a split personality in Riggins' head and that it is constantly egging him on and, and telling him to be the person that he really is. He's above all of these mere mortals. He's a superhero. He's a god. And we see through the course of the movie Riggin doing these kind of superhero type things. The movie shows him, you know, levitating and moving objects with his mind. And the question for a good part of the movie is, does Riggin actually have superpowers or is he slowly unraveling and about to fall apart as a human being? Yeah, and I think one of the most fascinating parts about this movie is not just the look into, you know, Riggin's mind. I really think the most interesting thing about this movie is to see how the other characters in the movie interact with him in this state. You know, everybody has their own agendas of what they're wanting to get out of it. You know, the one woman who I honestly can't remember her name just wants to become a Broadway star and she keeps thinking that this is going to be her break. And the other one is a young actress who is in love with Riggin and, and wants to be in a relationship with him but is recognizing that they're just not compatible. And there's a lot of stuff in this movie that's kind of strange, but I think one of the most interesting things really is the way that Inuritu puts these characters at opposition with one another. Interesting. Go go in on that for a little bit. So you have like Edward Norton's character, Mike Shiner, who clearly considers himself to be the epitome of a New York, you know, theater Broadway actor. And you, you see him pit himself against Michael Keaton from the very start. And he's telling him how to, how to deliver a line in his own production. You know, and throughout the movie, you see them battle back and forth about how this play should be run. And, and it, it's just a constant reminder to Riggin Thompson of how inadequate he is as an actor. I don't necessarily think it's inadequacy, though. I think he proves in the moment where he confronts him about the newspaper that Regan Thompson has the ability to act at a level of Edward Norton's character. Edward Norton just hates his decisions. And you're right, though, does display a desire to be this purist, right? This person who's never given up on what it truly means to be an actor. All of his lines are like one sentence, like fortune cookie things like the truth is always interesting. Or like, how do you know that line? He goes, don't worry about how I know the line. You know, right. he's just trying to at least portray, but at the same time, he has a sun tanning uh, bed delivered to his very, very small dressing room so that he could be a redneck. So it's just interesting. I think that they are essentially the same person and a similar quality of actor, but it's, it, it's Riggins' past that Norton hates as opposed to just him. But I think that they see each other in each other very clearly. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I want to take a step back for just a minute and kind of talk about the, the main characters in this movie. So we've talked about Michael Keaton as Regan Thompson. He is joined in a sort of family unit by his, his either separated wife or ex-wife, who's played by Amy Ryan. And then he's also joined in a, in a much more close capacity by his daughter, played by Emma Stone. And she is said to be or have been in rehab. She's a recovering addict. She's kind of spiraled out of control. Regan has a really strained relationship with both of them. And then on the theater side of things, you have Regan's best friend slash lawyer slash agent, played by Zach Galifianakis. You have the actors in this play that he's putting on, you know, behind the scenes, who are played by Edward Norton, uh, Naomi Watts, Andrea Riseborough. And what I really love about all of these characters is that they are used to such great effect by this script. The director, Alejandro Gonzalez Inuritu, he helped to write the script. And 
I think that this script is just fantastic. It's really, really funny. And I don't think that's a thing that you would get from, you know, that you would necessarily pick up on if you just heard someone describing the movie. But it's a really cynical, really biting kind of satire. And some of the line deliveries, some of the punchlines that they give, they're so, so witty and really funny. Okay. Do you really think you'll be ready for opening tomorrow? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, previews are pretty much a train wreck. We can't seem to get through a performance without a raging fire or a raging heart on. I'm broke. I'm not sleeping, like, you know, at all. And uh, this play kind of starting to feel like a miniature deformed version of myself that just keeps following me around and, like, hitting me in the balls with a... Like a tiny little hammer. I'm sorry, what was the question? Never mind. There's moments of, like, absurd comedy. Like, when you have Riggin and uh, Mike, played by Edward Norton, who are, like, getting into a slap fight on the ground, and one of them is in his underwear. Like, it's just, there's so much ridiculousness going on. And I was laughing out loud at parts of the movie. Did you guys have the same reaction? Oh, yeah. This is definitely a dark comedy in a lot of different ways. Um, and I, I think one of the the biggest ways that this movie is comedic is in the way that the script was so clearly written for the actors that are in the movie. You know, Michael Keaton is clearly playing a character who is based on himself, you know, because yeah. Michael Keaton starred in Batman and, you know, kind of fell out of the picture after that for a very long time. You know, Edward Norton is known for being extremely difficult to work with, you know, kind of pedantic and childish sometimes. And he's clearly playing a version of himself. And then, but in an opposite kind of way, you see Zach Galifianakis playing the exact opposite type of role that he would normally be cast in. You know, Zach Galifianakis is literally one of the most reasonable, normal characters who's trying to hold all of the insanity together. So I, I think that the way this script is written, it's almost a, it's a meta comedy of sorts commenting on the different types of actors that you find in Hollywood. I have to admit that the first two times I watched it, I probably chuckled a few times, but I actually kind of balked when I went on to IMDb and it was listed as a comedy because scathing satire like this actually kind of makes me, gives me like a happy, sad feeling because it is funny that this happens, but the fact that it's so close as opposed to like absurdist comedy where you're like, well, this would never happen. It, it pokes at something that is true, but it's so far that you can laugh at it. This is so close to truth for some of these actors and actresses that part of me is also like, this is just such a good critique. And I, I take it like seriously and get kind of sad that people live a life like this, like that they obsess over what one character says, like you confuse love and admiration. Like that's, I'm sure a lot of people do that who aren't actors and actresses, but I'm sure that's very prevalent for them. That'd be a tough life. I don't know. It doesn't sound exciting to me. No, you're totally right. And I think that's the main theme of the movie. It, you know, at the very beginning of the film, the first thing you see is a quote from Raymond Carver that, you know, that's some, asking something about, did you get what you wanted out of life? And, and the person says, yes. And then they said, what did you want? And he says, to be beloved upon the earth or something like that. And like th that's that's the whole theme of the film. Riggan Thompson, for a majority of the movie, is self-obsessed. He doesn't care about the people around him. He's not really considering their thoughts or their feelings. They he he only sees them for what they can do for him. And he's trying really really hard to impress certain people so that he can get his career back on track. And you know, we'll get into this more in the analysis of the movie, but I think that the ending of the film is what it is because Riggin finally breaks out of that mold of trying to impress other people or realizing what it is that he actually wanted out of life, what made life fulfilling for him. So, yeah, Jordan, I think you're definitely onto something there. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Bob. And I really think that if there's anything that's relatable about this movie to a common, you know, American person, it would be that message, you know, that message that we're not necessarily defined by our careers. You know, we it's it's important that we find love and admiration in places other than our workplaces, because otherwise we can get so wrapped up in who we are there. It really is detrimental to the rest of our lives. So maybe this is a good place to talk about some of the characters in the movie, you know, that aren't 
our main character, Regan Thompson. Brad, I'm going to throw it over to you. Why don't you pick an actor and talk about a, a performance in this movie that really stuck out to you? You know, I was really struck by Amy Ryan's performance in this movie. You know, they they kind of use her as an anchor for Regan Thompson in a lot of ways. She's kind of the the thing that keeps him connected to reality. Honestly, in certain ways, even though his daughter is around, Amy Ryan keeps him attached to his daughter more than her actual presence does. You know, there's something about the way she connects with him that makes you realize, like, no, she's a normal person who really loves, you know, Regan Thompson, but is struggling to get past all of the problems that he has. Yeah, I really like her being a sounding board for Michael Keaton. I think she elicits the saddest response, but maybe the most true thing that's said in the whole film. Michael Keaton finally confesses that he wished he hadn't had his daughter's birth videotape. And, mm. you know, I don't have a child, but Bob, you would probably know what this is like. Like he is now in the 50s grieving, not being there when his daughter is born. It's like too little, too late. And it seems like this then contributed to a pattern of spiraling downwards of just not being there for him. And Emma Stone's character admits that as well. Like he just tries so hard to not be a dad. Basically, he tried everything he could to do what it looked like to be a dad without actually being present. And I think she's the best critique and the most grounded critique of the whole lifestyle without being in it. I just love her character. Yeah, absolutely. And that last scene that they have together, Jordan, that you're talking about, it's right in the middle of opening night of this play. And we have already seen Michael Keaton's character kind of come undone and go completely crazy. And we know that that he's insane. And he has this weird moment in his dressing room of just utter calm and self-reflection and what looks like, you know, coming to terms with himself and kind of having some peace. And he has this conversation with his ex-wife who comes in to say hi at intermission. And what I really love about that scene is, you know, this movie was shot to look like it was done in one shot. And so that means that all of these dialogue scenes are really just one long camera setup that follows these actors back and forth and then pushes in on their face when they kind of have their monologue and watching Michael Keaton go through the range of emotions that he goes through in that scene, you know, it, it's incredible to watch. And I think Amy Ryan really helps get that performance out of him in that moment. Yeah. I'm curious though, Bob, are there any other performances that really struck you in this movie? Well, I mean, Edward Norton's great. Edward Norton's always great. I really do love that he and Michael Keaton are both playing these sort of like meta commentaries on themselves. But if I had to pick one performance to talk about, I think it would be Emma Stone. I think she is just fantastic in this movie. She gets nominated for an Oscar for it. And again, this is one of those situations where the way this movie is shot, the cinematography being what it is with this kind of constantly roving camera she has this great scene earlier in the film when she and Michael Keaton are still really at odds with each other and her frustrations with him spill over and it's done in this one long close up shot and she just unloads on him and and basically, you know, accuses him of being a nobody, of chasing after fame and reminding him that you don't matter in this world and no one cares about you. This is my chance to finally do some work that actually means something. It means something to who? You had a career, Dad, before the third comic book movie, before people started to forget who was inside that bird costume. You were doing a play based on a book that was written 60 years ago for a thousand rich old white people whose only real concern is going to be where they go to have their cake and coffee when it's over. Nobody gives a shit but you. And let's face it, Dad, you are not doing this for the sake of art. You are doing this because you want to feel relevant again. Well, guess what? There is an entire world out there where people fight to be relevant every single day, and you act like it doesn't exist. Things are happening in a place that you ignore, a place that, by the way, has already forgotten about you. I mean, who the fuck are you? You hate bloggers. You mock Twitter. You don't even have a Facebook page. You're the one who doesn't exist. You're doing this because you're scared to death, like the rest of us, that you don't matter. And you know what? You're right. You don't. It's not important, okay? You're not important. Get used to it. And she finishes, like, spilling this vitriol at him. And then the camera just stays there. And you watch her finally kind of, like, breathe a little bit and then realize what it is that she said. And I love that this movie gives its performers 
room to have moments like that, like that extra 10 seconds that the camera stays on her and you watch her face change into realizing how hurtful she just was. It really aids the performances. And I think it puts Emma Stone's performance right up there with the best performances in the movie. Yeah, Bob, I think you're really pointing out something important about the choice to film this movie as one long continuous shot in that this movie reflects real life much better than almost any other movie I've seen because it refuses to leave people in any moment of the movie. Especially, you know, you pointed out probably the best example of that with Emma Stone, where, you know, you as an audience don't get to get away from the satisfaction of her chewing him out. You can, you're not allowed to just get a free cut into the next scene and be satisfied with, yeah, she told him. You're forced to sit there just the same way that she is with that choice to chew him out. And you're forced to sit there with the realization of like, Man, he might have deserved everything I just said, but he's still my father, mm-hmm. and I probably could have done that better. And and if that's not a reflection of how real human beings live their lives, then I don't know what else there is. Well, and Brad, you're getting at something that I think is really crucial to this movie, too, which is that all of the characters, or at least most of the characters, are in a sort of constant state of like self-realization. They're constantly learning things about themselves through other characters. At two different points in the movie, Emma Stone's character and Edward Norton's character play truth or dare, and they are, like, brutally honest with each other about what they think. And the only person in the film for a long period of time that really isn't truthful about what's going on with him is Riggin Thompson. And I think that his journey towards self-discovery, his journey towards realizing something about himself is what the movie is really building towards. I, I'm glad that you guys brought up both of those characters, I think the truth and dare scenes are incredible because they epitomize both of those characters' faults. Uh, Edward Norton is all about the truth, all about vocalizing what is real, but it has, in reality, I think very little courage. I think he sa- I think he points to that when he says, like, nothing is a problem for me on stage, but in his real life, it's a mess. You know, he can't do anything to fix it. Uh, In reality, though, Emma Stone is afraid to often speak truth, but her actions have played, you know, a huge role in her life. She's a recovering addict and is still struggling with those things. She's trying to find meditation. And so for both of them to do truth or dare and for him to only do – for him to only choose truth and for her to only choose dare, I think is really fascinating. I think that's – and then the fact that they find each other and really, I would say, merge their dysfunctions – Uh, but maybe in a happy way, I think really just points to another reality that is star-studded life. Yeah, Jordan, I totally agree with you. The truth and dare scenes, if we hadn't brought them up soon, I was going to bring them up. They are absolutely fascinating because I really think that it is some of the best script I've ever seen in a movie to really draw out who a character is in just a very short span of time. I love those scenes. And yet at the same time, I feel like I have to reiterate that this is a comedy. Like, it's a really funny movie. There's a lot of really great one-liners that come out in this movie. You know, when they first introduced the character of Tabitha, who is like the, the evil New York Times theater critic, it's Edward Norton and Michael Keaton standing at a bar. And Edward Norton basically says, hey, do you see this woman at the end of the bar? She's the woman that looks like she just got done licking a homeless guy's butt. (laughs) <laughs> and, then, and then Michael Keaton looks over his shoulder and goes, wow, she does look like she just licked a homeless guy's butt. <laughs> like, there's just these weird little absurd comments throughout the movie. They just kind of had me rolling, you know, in the in the scene where where Mike very selfishly tries to take advantage of his girlfriend basically on stage, Naomi Watts. She runs off and the other actress in the play comes to comfort her. And Naomi Watts is crying and she says, why don't I have any self-respect? And then the answer is, you're an actress, honey. And it's just like there's there's just these great little cynical digs throughout the movie. And Brad, it honestly reminded me a lot of some of what we heard in Billy Wilder, like in Some Like It Hot. Was the comedy in this movie similar to anything else you've seen before? Honestly, Bob, I, I'm kind of struggling that you're you're continuing to push this towards a comedy. I guess I would lean more towards Jordan's interpretation that that yes, this is slightly comedic, but it's so deeply satirical 
that it's it's hard for me to find all of these lines to be super funny because there's such obvious critiques of real actors and the way actors and actresses are. I I really can't think of any other movies that that have a similar sense of deep cutting satire in the same way that this film does. I think that's a fair point. And we definitely haven't watched a lot of satire on this podcast yet. You know, I was taking notes partway through the movie where I'm like, oh, this reminds me of, you know, the character of Howard Beale in the movie Network, which we haven't watched yet. Or this and this reminds me of A Clockwork Orange, which we haven't watched yet. So I think as we get further into the podcast, you'll start to see some of these themes come up. But I am glad that you're picking up on like how how cutting the satire is in this movie. Yeah, I mean, I guess honestly, the the gross realness of this movie does almost remind me of a Tarantino film in, in a certain sense. When you watch Inglorious Bastards, it's such an obvious overstatement of the, some of the problems that you saw with Nazi Germany that that it's just pointing out the obvious in in humorous ways. So I guess if there's any film we've watched already, may, maybe Inglorious Bastards in a weird way kind of reminds me of this movie. Well, then it's appropriate that we have Jordan here because the last episode he was on was in Glorious Bastards. But I love but that's the thing about satire, right? It's like we create satire to give us an opportunity to see the absurdity in everyday life. Like I remember being introduced to my first real sense of what satire was in high school when we had to read a modest proposal. Oh yeah, Jonathan Swift. Yeah, it's so good. Um it's a cookbook about how to cook Irish babies. And it's supposed to be humorous, but what he's pointing to is the fact that the English aren't willing to help the Irish in the Great Potato Famine. And so while they're not literally cooking Irish babies and eating them, they are essentially letting them have the same result, which is to die of starvation. But I really do – maybe it's because I relate so much as somebody who considers himself at least a modest creative that I see these same things in myself. I desire for – desire for fame, a desire for success, a desire to be known. And will it drive me to these depths? Will it drive me to be like Regan Thompson and Edward Norton's character? I don't know. It's a good question, I think. I think it is a good question. And I really loved what you said about the the overall tone of this movie, which is that it kind of makes you happy, sad. And I think maybe it's time for us to transition to something that will hopefully make us happy, happy which is our whiskey segment for the week. We're going to be drinking uh, Irish whiskey again, which is Brad's favorite kind of whiskey. So what do you guys say we get into trying this Jameson Caskmates IPA? Yeah, Bob, let's get to it. All right, so when we come back from the break, we'll be trying Jameson Caskmates IPA, and then you'll hear our favorite segment, Hot Takes. Hot Takes. Stay tuned. And that transition music was brought to you by Flow Fills, F-L-O-F-I-L-Z, Flow Fills, and his album Transit. You can follow him on Instagram or on SoundCloud, Flow Fills. And today we are trying Jameson Caskmates IPA. Now, Jameson has started this new line of whiskeys where they're finishing their Irish whiskey in used beer barrels. They have one called IPA Caskmates, and they have one called uh, Caskmates Stout so today we're trying IPA, and Brad, you know, we, we're the Film and Whiskey Podcast, but we're not beyond drinking beer. Are you a big IPA drinker? Bob, I'm going to be honest with you. I have had a few IPAs that I'm okay with. Um, there's one called Elvis Juice out of a brewery down here in Columbus. They're like, yeah, it's pretty decent. It's got some pomegranate stuff. But any of your traditional super hoppy IPAs, I am not a big fan of. I'm not either. I actually really, really dislike IPAs. I don't like my beer to be really hoppy and bitter. So I'm interested to see what comes out of trying this whiskey. Jordan is going to be joining us for this review. So we'll get three hopefully really good opinions on this whiskey. What are you guys picking up on the nose of Jameson Caskmates IPA? Honestly, on the nose, I'm I'm kind of getting what I would expect. There, you can kind of smell a little bit of that hoppiness on this whiskey. Mm-hmm. It's very different than any other whiskey I've ever had. 
Yeah, and we've had so many Irish whiskeys at this point that you kind of know the general profile of an Irish whiskey when you smell it. This one smells, I don't know what the word would be. It's not floral. I guess I would say like herbal. You're right, Brad. It really does smell hoppy. Yeah. It smells like some sort of bitter herb has been added to this. Yeah, it's a little bit sour almost. Yep, yeah, I'm, I'm getting like green apple. I don't know if you're getting that as well, but that's kind of, that's that's the sourness for me. Yeah, so honestly, it's not the most pleasant nose for me. I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10. I don't really know where we're going with this. Yeah, I don't want to... I don't want to give a negative opinion too soon. I am not optimistic, but maybe this just means that it's like super complex or something. I have no idea. I'll give it a six and a half on the nose, which means it's time for us to take a sip. Wow. Yeah. I will say that once you get past the very first tip of your tongue flavor, it does remind me of an Irish whiskey. It's very smooth. It's very bright. Um, like you said, Bob, it's kind of like herbally, florally. But yeah, Bob, the first thing that hits my tongue is a blast of hops, and I am not enjoying that. Yeah, I don't like this at all. This is <laughs> this is not good whiskey, dude. It, okay, so it's not sweet at all, which automatically tells you I'm probably not going to like it. It is really hoppy. Like, it, it's very bitter. You're right, Brad. It's it's almost like like a grass flavor. There's still a little bit of that like sour green apple to it, but there's no sweetness to it. I am noticing that this one has a lot more sort of alcohol burn to it. There's a more of like a tingle than there was with the regular Jameson, which I don't know if that has anything to do with finishing it in these beer barrels, but it, it almost seems like a harsher whiskey than the regular Jameson did. And I think that's a combination of how bitter it is and what the alcohol is doing. I'm only going to give this a five and a half on the taste. I'm actually going to raise up from my nose. I'm actually going to give it a six on taste. I, I do think there's some interesting stuff going on here. I almost get a sense of like peppermint as I'm, as I'm drinking this. There are some interesting things going on. And because of its complexity, I'm going to give it a higher score than the nose. But it's still not my favorite whiskey. Jordan, how are you doing over there, bud? I'm doing well. I got to admit, I'm also not an impartial observer because I am not a huge fan of IPAs. So I was not a great person to choose to be with you guys. I also taste the hops. I smell the hops. I don't think that it is a terrible taste. I like IPAs as like a good second or third beer potentially. Um, but yeah, I'm not a huge fan of this. This isn't the best I've ever had for sure. Well, and if I'm being honest, my my review of this or my score for this only goes down from here because the finish, I think, is the worst part of the whole experience so far. I definitely got some of, you know, when we drink bourbon, what we call the Kentucky hug. It definitely warms you going down. But the finish on this is incredibly bitter. The only thing that's lasting on my palate is that bitter, hoppy flavor. I really hate this finish, man. Like, it's uh, it's bad. I'm going to give it a four and a half. Yeah, Bob, I'm going to stick with you on the finish. It, it's just too much. Like, I know that's probably not a very good in-depth review, but there's just kind of too much going on. It's it's overwhelming in unhealthy ways. I'm going to give it a four and a half on the finish. All right, and that takes us to overall balance. Again, this is nose, taste, and finish put together. I feel like my tendency on this podcast is to score things higher than I actually feel about them when I dislike something, because I can see why someone would enjoy this. If you like IPAs, this is probably like a dream come true for you. But I truly dislike everything about this whiskey. And I don't think that it's a poorly made whiskey necessarily. And so that's where my struggle is. And I think that's why I keep coming out to like middle of the road scores. Is it well balanced? I don't know. Maybe because those hops are present all the way through. So maybe that says it's really well balanced. But I had an unpleasant experience all the way through. So I'm going to give it a five and a half on the balance. Yeah, I'm actually going to give it a seven on balance. I, I really do respect what they've done here. And it is extremely well balanced. You know what you're getting into on the nose, on the taste, on the finish. It, it is a very well balanced whiskey. But like you said, Bob, I, I'm not a huge fan of that balance. But they did achieve that. All right. So that takes us to our final category, which is value. In the state of Ohio, a fifth of Jameson Caskmates IPA will cost you $31.99 plus tax. So we're looking at a $32 bottle of whiskey. I don't know how I feel about this, Brad, because $32 is not like overpriced. I don't think it's exorbitant. You know, it's definitely a specialty version of regular Jameson and it's priced accordingly. I think the price is is fairly good for what you're getting. This is just not my cup of tea. 
And for $32, I could probably think of at least two or three other Irish whiskeys I would rather have for the price. But at the same time, again, I don't think that they're charging too much for it. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're in the right spot, Bob. You know, if you're going to get a specialty whiskey that tastes like something unique and interesting, you know, we've seen some wine barrel finished whiskeys that cost $150. So the fact that Jameson is able to mass produce this, at the very least, interesting whiskey for $32, I honestly hate to say it, but that's a really good value. Yeah, and I'm falling somewhere in the middle because it's a really good value. I just dislike it. So that's why it becomes hard to score for me because it's like I wouldn't pay this much for it because I just don't like the product. So I think I'm just going to go middle of the road again and give it a 5 out of 10 on value. Brad, what would your value score be? Yeah, I'll give it a 7 out of 10 for honestly the exact same reasons that you did. You know, it's not my cup of tea, but I can recognize that it's good value. So yeah, I'll I'll give it a 7 out of 10. Yeah, you know, I've tried the wine barrel finish myself, and I really enjoyed that. And so I can see the value in different types types of bourbons and whiskeys. But again, just not being a huge fan of IPAs. I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. So I'd probably jump right in the middle of you guys and put it a solid 6, 6 out of 10. All right, so that brings my final score out to a 27 out of 50. Brad, what does that bring you out to? Yeah, Bob, I'm kind of right there with you. I'm at a 29.5 out of 50. So that puts our average out to a 28.25 or a 56.5 out of 100. This is not a great whiskey. And I would probably even say that I don't know if it would reach the 50 out of 100 mark personally. Looking at my scores, I feel like I was a little bit too generous. Brad, do you feel like this is a fair score for the whiskey? I do. I I think that one of the reasons our scores were brought up is because we put value in the value category. And I think it's okay to recognize that we don't care for a whiskey, but that it's still decent value. So yeah, I, I think this would be an accurate score for where this whiskey would stand. Would you recommend it? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um... Yes, I would recommend it. I I think that it has value in its uniqueness. And even if it's not something that you would like long term, I think if you get a shot of it, if you're out somewhere and just kind of savor it and enjoy it and go, wow, I tried that and my horizons have been broadened. But yeah, that's worth it. I would recommend it if you like IPAs. If you already know that you don't like drinking IPAs, there is nothing in this whiskey that is going to make you appreciate either whiskey or IPA more than you did before. And I think that you, you got to know yourself a little bit before you go into this whiskey. So if you like IPAs, by all means, dive right in. I think this will be a great little treat for you. If you dislike it, avoid at all costs. All right. So, guys, what do you say we get back into talking about the movie Birdman? All right, so that was Jameson Caskmates IPA. Brad, I think it's time we reintroduce one of our favorite segments on the show. It's been out of commission for a couple weeks, but we're going to get back into talking about hot takes. I think that what we need to do, you know, in uh, White Christmas when they're singing the snow song, and they go, snow, snow, snow. We need to do that for hot takes. We just need to, like, make a chord? (laughs) Yes. All right. So Hot Takes is the segment of our show where we find one-star reviews of the movie that we're currently looking at, and we decide whether these reviews have any validity to them. Spoiler alert, they do not. Bob, I think my favorite part of this segment is still whenever you read their usernames. (laughs) (laughs) Well, prepare yourself, my friend. So our first one-star review for the day, our first hot take, comes courtesy of IMDB user mboyd1986. And mboyd's review is titled, Waste of Two Hours. Yes, I know. It's arty farty. And if you don't appreciate the ridiculously long takes, then you are a Philistine. I'm proud to be a Philistine. I kept waiting for something to happen. It didn't. 
I kept wondering, how did they get the camera that was on the roof looking up at the building at night to then see it in daytime and then slowly go down to the street and backwards through a metal grill and then through a window and then... Sorry, where was I? Oh yes, what was the plot again? Forget the plot. Just look at all the long takes and the arty-farty actoring going on. Sometimes, I just wish I could sue these people for wasting two hours of my life. One star. Bob, I really hope that we someday on iTunes get a one-star review that says, look at all this arty-farty podcasting going on. I hope we start getting one-star reviews on iTunes from the people whose reviews we're reading during hot takes. Oh, that would be brutal. Just, just super offended at us reading their terrible, terrible takes. Yeah, the the irony of that would just be out of this world. All right, our second hot take for the day comes from IMDB user Kirkland Tyler, which leads me to believe that his name might be Tyler Kirkland. <laughs> no. Tyler titles his review, I created this account for the sole purpose of reviewing this piece of junk. Coming into this movie, I had heard bad things from people who had seen it, but great things from critics. After leaving, the only good thing about it was the acting. This movie definitely was different and unique, but there's a difference from being different and making art and being different and making a piece of crap. The fact that this movie was nominated for Best Picture above a piece of art such as Interstellar is appalling. I do applaud the director for taking a risk and trying to make an unconventional movie, but he needed to first develop a plot in order to make a good movie. I strongly discourage anyone from wasting their time and money seeing this. If you want to watch a movie that's different and considered art, watch any Christopher Nolan, Stanley Kubrick, or Quentin Tarantino movie. Not this pathetic excuse for entertainment. And to critics, please learn the difference between unconventional artistic movies and this bloody rubbish. One star. Bloody rubbish, huh? Bloody rubbish! I just love, I just I w- love it when the Christopher Nolan fanboys come out. Like, in full force. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Like, Tyler, at two different points in this review, had to mention Christopher Nolan movies, and then was like, you know, if you really want to watch something artistic, maybe try any Christopher Nolan movie. Have you seen The Dark Knight Rises? Uh, It's an utter work of genius. If he'd wanted to be like Christopher Nolan, he should have put his review on two, three different timelines, and then we'd have to piece it together by the end to see what his review... <laughs> <laughs> That's the movie Christopher Nolan wants in the world. We need to make this happen. Birdman 2. <laughs> the Birdman Rises. The Birdman Rises. <laughs> All right, so guys, let's get back into talking about Birdman. Now, I know we touched on this in the first half of the episode, but real quick, I just want to talk about some of the technical aspects of the movie. This movie wins an Oscar for cinematography. The cinematographer is Emmanuel Lubeski. And if you've been listening to the podcast, that's a name you've heard at least once before. That's a name you've heard at least once before because he is the guy that shot The Tree of Life, which... When we recorded that episode, Brad and I both raved about the cinematography in that movie as well. Brad, did you notice a lot of similarities between this movie and The Tree of Life in the way that it was shot? It's interesting because the single shot, you know, that we follow throughout the entire movie for Birdman, it you know, it is very different than Tree of Life. Tree of Life is almost the exact opposite. You get a lot of short, choppy scenes where you're rushing in on the children playing on the bed or... You know, you get kind of a short looping scene where you see the mother crying when she finds out that her son is dead or, you know, the movie is just very choppy and short and you get, you know, short, quick glimpses of these people's lives where literally Birdman is the exact opposite of that. You get these long, slow purviews into their life. And so it's a very differently shot movie. And yet you can see the similarities between the two. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, he's famous for that that sort of wandering camera and putting it right up in the actors' faces. Like, this whole movie is done in basically close-up. And I think the Tree of Life was pretty similar. Yeah, I love the comparison to Tree of Life. I actually watched it right around the time you guys were doing the podcast for it uh, because I'd never seen it before, and I wanted to talk to Brad about it. I'm not a huge Tree of Life fan. I did really enjoy the cinematography. Um, But I do like the fact in terms of plot, whatever plot there is in Tree of Life, they're both critiques. uh, And I think Tree of Life maybe doubles down on subtlety in its themes. And you kind of have to guess and look and ask questions. I think Birdman is like the least subtle critiquing movie I've, I've ever watched. It literally names every theme in dialogue of like, who am I? I, Who, what is my identity? Am I a sellout? 
am I a good parent? Like every good, every theme, which I think are all really good. They literally just have lines of dialogue that name it. And honestly, I like that quite a bit, especially maybe in comparison to more subtle films like Tree of Life. Yeah, Jordan, I think that's that's such a great segue into getting into like our analysis of the movie because you're you're totally right. The writing in this movie is intentionally, I mean, when you're doing satire, you kind of have to do it this way, but they name exactly what they want the theme to be. And I'm even thinking of, you know, the sequence where we finally see Riggin kind of lose it and snap and the Birdman voice that's been talking to him the whole movie kind of manifests and you see Michael Keaton as Birdman walking down the street next to Michael Keaton as Riggin Thompson. And at one point, Riggin disappears from view and and the character Birdman is like looking straight into the camera and he's addressing the audience directly. And he's talking to us and he's basically saying, look at all this stuff that's playing out around me because Michael Keaton is imagining a Birdman type movie where there's explosions happening and Birdman flies in to save the day. That's what I'm talking about. Bones rattling, big, loud. Fast. Look at these people. Look at their eyes. They're all sparkling. They love the sh. They love blood. They love action. Not this talky, depressing, philosophical bullshit. Yes. And the next time you screech, it'll explode into millions of eardrums. You'll glimmer on thousands of screens around the globe. Another blockbuster. You are a god. See? There you go, you mother f- Gravity doesn't even apply to you. And it's it's just so funny to me because it's like the movie is turning the the sort of like meta commentary it's been doing in on itself like it's even admitting like yeah this talky depressing philosophical stuff we know you're not on board for this but how about this explosion and so it's like it's critiquing everybody it's even critiquing the audience and that's what i really love about this movie is it subtle absolutely not but does it work yeah i think it does yeah and the funny thing about that scene was you know i am not a big marvel fan like i I liked the movies well enough i took like a six-year break from them and didn't watch any of them so I'm, I'm not the biggest Marvel fan in the world, but, you know, I recognize they're, they're good movies and such. But literally when that scene started and all of a sudden there's helicopters and explosions and a giant bird machine attacking New York City, it kind of perked me up a little bit. You know, like I've just been watching an hour and a half of Michael <laughs> Keaton griping about life. And all of a sudden there's a little bit of action on the scene. It genuinely did perk me up without me even realizing it. So like – it's a difficult critique because I think it's just such an honest look at the fact that the flashy explosions on an innate level will attract more people than the introspection. The role that that scene is playing in the movie, too, is super important because this is right after Michael Keaton has been told by that you know evil critic that she's going to destroy his play. He goes out and gets super drunk, wakes up the next morning. And the Birdman persona is basically trying to comfort or console him and saying like, well, maybe you're not a good actor after all, but who cares? You don't need to be a good actor. You, you're you Birdman. You're better than this. And so in that scene, like he's using the Birdman persona to build his ego back up again. And that's kind of the point of this whole movie is he is going insane. And at the same time, he's deluding himself into thinking like, I'm super important because I was Birdman. At one point, Birdman even tells him, you are Birdman because without me, there's nothing left but you. And it really gives you an insight into what Michael Keaton's character thinks of himself. Like, he cannot find any sort of worth or validation. And that's why he's doing this ridiculous play on Broadway, because he he thinks that having validation from these theater critics is what's going to make him feel important again. And then when that doesn't work out, he falls right back into, okay, well, I was Birdman. Yeah, and I think that you really see that at the end of the movie when, you know, Zach Galifianakis brings in the newspaper review. I'm assuming it was written by the critic that, you know, he reamed out in the bar. Yeah, yep. But she she gives him this glowing review basically saying that he has rewritten the script for American theater as a whole. You know, she's giving them this this glowing review. And I think it's honestly kind of that sense of, 
well, I got Hollywood fame and that wasn't enough. So now I'm going to get New York Broadway fame and that will be enough. But you kind of get this sense at the end when he jumps out the window that neither New York fame, you know, Broadway fame or Hollywood fame are actually going to mean anything because what Birdman said is true. If you don't have Birdman or if you don't have your theater success, then all you're stuck with is you. And I think that that is the message that this movie is trying to send home is that it doesn't matter where you find your success. If you don't have some understanding of where you are at emotionally and who you are as a person, then nothing is going to truly bring you satisfaction in this world. I agree with about half of what you said, Brad. I actually, I really agree with the last thing you said, but I think the movie actually takes a very different stance to get there. When Riggin goes back out on stage and you can tell that he's gone crazy and that the Birdman persona is in control and he takes a real gun out on stage and then shoots himself. He wakes up in the hospital. They've reconstructed his face. Ironically, he had blown his nose off. You know, it, again, the, the Birdman motif of like having a beak. It, they replace his nose. And you think, OK, maybe now that he's shot himself in the face, there's been some sense knocked back into him. But no, there's Birdman again, right at the end of the movie, like right there to nag him again. And he finally gets the validation that he's been craving so long from this theater critic. And Zach Galifianakis even looks at him and says, like, hey, man, what's wrong? Isn't isn't this what you wanted all along? And he kind of sadly says, yeah, this is what I wanted. And I think in that moment, he starts having that realization that, like, this is what I wanted. And like you said, Brad, it, it's not enough for me. This is unfulfilling. But at the same time. He's realizing that impressing the theater people required him to literally kill himself or try to kill himself, and he no longer wants that. And I think at the end of the day, what we saw in that final scene with Amy Ryan's character was that all he really ever wanted was the love and validation of his wife and daughter. And I don't think he even realized it until that moment. And when he finally gets the acceptance and the love from his ex-wife, and then in the hospital scene where you can tell he finally has a moment of connection with his daughter, I think that's when he gets it. I think that's when his character finally gets it. What I love about that last scene is that they have Riggin wearing this gauze on his face that looks like a Birdman mask. But it's not, you know, it's not the same mask he was wearing before. It's not this rubber lycra suit. It's a mask made out of gauze. And I think what that's telling us, you know, in terms of what Riggin thinks about himself is that he's not the bird man that he thought he was. He's not this deluded god-like figure. He's more human. He's real. And in a sense, he's still a hero because he finally ended up being his daughter's hero. I think he finally has her respect at the end of the movie. And that's what the new Birdman mask made out of hospital bandages represents. But at the end of the day, again, this is a satire. This is a cynical movie. At the end of the day, even after he has that realization, he still goes and tries to fly out the window like Birdman because he's crazy and he kills himself. So, you know, <laughs> it's just it's an interesting movie. I'm really interested to hear, Jordan, do you have any take on what you think of the ending of the film? I think it's fascinating. Um, I was confused. I've seen the movie three times. This is my third viewing. I think each time I think about it a little differently. I think there's no way to look around the reality that Emma Stone looks down and she her eyes aren't glued to anything. But then she looks up and she smiles and I think you could take multiple meanings from that. I think it could be that she's also maybe somewhat delusional, which is certainly possible. But I think it does potentially, depending on the message of the movie, it recasts the whole film in a different light. The potential for the reality that he might not be as crazy as he seems to be, uh, that he's going to be this sensational star. But, you know, I think it's hard to tell. I think they leave it ambiguous on purpose. Uh, because that's what satire does, and that's the maybe the most subtle part of the whole film. But I, I really enjoy it. I think you can take a lot of different stances or different takes on it, and I'd find them all probably pretty pretty well thought out, personally. Yeah, Bob, I, I really actually kind of struggled with your takes on the final part of the movie. I, I, I mean, I agree. Like, obviously, he has a fake Birdman mask with the gauze and so on and so forth. I just don't know if I would agree that, you know, his wife is finally grounded and, and that he just finds that relationship and now he's okay. I 
I really do think it's more of a sense that he kind of realizes that in order to truly find himself, he has to put behind the praise and the identity that he finds in the Birdman persona as well as the theatrics persona. Yeah, I, t- I actually totally agree with that. That's I think that's what I was trying to say. And is that like he he no longer needs the validation of the theater people because what he's found is that he he did make a difference. Like that quote at the beginning of the movie that he did feel himself beloved on the earth because he found acceptance and love and appreciation from his daughter and his wife. And I think the fulfillment of those relationships helps him get over what he was looking for in the, you know, the validation of the theater people. Yeah, no, I and I think that's a really beautiful message that almost anybody could understand, you know, and, and obviously it, I think it's hard for people to watch this movie because they don't relate to Hollywood. They don't relate to what it means to be an actor. They don't relate to what it means to have, you know, people who don't engage in your profession critiquing every single thing that you do. You know, there is kind of a sense of Edward Norton where he talks about how actors are, you know, putting themselves out there and continuing to bear the deepest parts of their soul for people to watch. You you understand that acting is such a different profession than almost any other profession you can have here in America. And yet, I think the questions that they are asking as actors are questions that any person on a steel line, on you know, a burger line, anywhere in this country could relate to, which is what gives me value? What gives me validation in this world? Is it the relationships with my family? Is it the job that I'm doing? Is it the money that I make? You know, what makes me important in this world? And and that's a question that anyone can relate to. Yeah, I think you're 100% right, Brad. And and the, that's what I love about this movie is that it has themes that are universal and really make you think about your own life and, and the impact you're making and what makes an impact on you. And on the other side of the coin, the sort of like cynical satire side of the coin, it also is the kind of movie that just goes hard on everybody. Like it it critiques everybody and everything. It critiques Riggin. It critiques actors for being pretentious. It critiques the audience for only enjoying, you know, superhero movies. It critiques theater critics. And I think when this movie comes out, you actually see a huge backlash because it gets really, really praised by critics. And then all of a sudden it starts getting Oscar buzz. And then you see this backlash where critics are like, well, actually, it's not that good after all. We don't really like this movie anymore. And uh, what critics tend to hold up is the portrayal of the critic in the movie. And they said, like, we don't like that they made this person so one dimensional, which is the whole point of that satire, like that satirical element. So what I love about this movie is like there's an opportunity for everybody to get something super positive out of it. And it's also an equal opportunity offender. There's an opportunity for everybody to get mad at how they're being portrayed in the movie as well. So, Brad, I want to hear what you think about this movie overall. I want to hear your score. And would you recommend? So, honestly, I kind of want to go back to the question that I asked at the very start of this podcast. What do you think this movie says then when you look at it in the light of the fact that Michael Keaton returned to the superhero world and he literally played a bird character in a Spider-Man movie in the Marvel Universe. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think that's really funny. And, like, that was something that I saw a lot of people make that connection when Spider-Man Homecoming came out. I don't think Michael Keaton does that movie without knowing what he's doing. And I think maybe he's just having a, a little bit of fun with it. I'm just happy that this movie sparked the Michael Keaton renaissance because Mm -hmm. a year after this movie, he's in spotlight, which wins the Oscar. You know, just a couple years after that, we see him in a huge tentpole Marvel film. So whatever the reasons are, or however funny it looks to us, like I'm just glad we're getting more Michael Keaton in our lives. So realistically, could you say that Spider-Man homecoming is actually a continuation of the Birdman universe? Let's do it, man. Birdman 4. They kept talking about Birdman 4. All right. Well, Bob, honestly, my final score for this movie is going to be a nine and a half out of 10. You know, there's certain things I didn't care for in the movie, but I cannot find many things wrong with this movie. The message is poignant and and it it cuts at who we are as Americans. I, I think that the acting performances are over the top spectacular. I am just fabulously impressed by this movie, and I fully understand why it won the Best Picture. 
Jordan, what do you think of this film? Uh, I love this movie. I give it a solid eight. I really enjoy watching it, and it never gets old. The fast pace, I've been gifted with boredom, so the fast pace cinematography really speaks to me, and the message is just really good. So, eight out of ten, easy. Brad, I'm also going to give this movie a nine and a half out of ten. And it's like, ironically, it's one of those movies that regular people think is too pretentious and critics think is too lowbrow or like not pretentious enough. So this movie doesn't seem to please a lot of people. But I looked on IMDb and it has 500,000 uh, reviews or ratings and it has a 7.7. So for being a movie that we didn't think reached a lot of people, it has a pretty good overall score. So it seems like most people at least appreciate this movie. I don't think it's perfect, but, you know, five years on, I really do still think it's an important piece of movie making and it's just a fun movie to watch. So I'm going to give it a nine and a half as well. But we want to know what you think. Film and Whiskey Nation, how do you feel about the movie Birdman? Is it too pretentious, too lowbrow? Let us know. Bob, where can they find us on social media? They can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, at Film Whiskey. That's at Film Whiskey. Also, if you want to call in and ream us out on the air, you can call us at 216-800-5923. Once again, that number is 216-800-5923. Next week, we will be back on Monday on our regularly scheduled day preparing for the Christmas holiday. Brad and I are going to be dropping a special bonus Christmas episode where we do a movie fight. And the topic of our movie fight is The Grinch versus A Charlie Brown Christmas. I am super excited to argue with Brad about those two animated classics. Brad, do you want to spoil it and say what team you're on? Team Grinch or Team Charlie Brown? I'm on Team Bob Sucks. I hate you so much. <laughs> so we'll see you next week for that special bonus episode for the Film and Whiskey Podcast. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And I'm Jordan McCain. And we'll see you next time. I think that what we need to do, you know, in uh, White Christmas when they're singing the snow song and they go, snow, snow, snow. We need to do that for hot takes. We just need to like make a chord. Yeah. Hot yeah, takes, yeah. hot takes, hot takes. There. Hot takes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Hot, hot takes. takes, hot takes.